This video is a compilation of all the Naruto content I've created in the past year. Since all of these pieces of analysis fall under the broad theme of resolution in Naruto, I decided to streamline the viewing process for new and returning fans who want to get into more of my stuff. I've done my best to organize each individual video into one huge analysis movie, one where you can easily stop by and watch, reach a new transitional segment, pause, and come back to watch later. Of course, I wouldn't fault anyone for watching this all in one sitting, as this deep dive into Naruto's themes was originally supposed to be one mega video anyway. And now, here that gargantuan video is. So, sit back, relax, and maybe grab a cold one while I talk no jutsu you into loving one of my favorite stories ever. In a world where children are bred to be tools of war, to mature much faster than they otherwise should, it only makes sense that this same world would allow for an environment that tests the upper limits of this rapid maturity. The Blood Mist Village earned its epithet tenfold. Even the idea of camaraderie is taught to only be a facade, crumbling at any given moment. When it's the mission over the missioned, what good does friendship do if it has more potential to end like the graduation exam rather than any perceivable positive outcome? This was Zabuza's most profound lesson, not only because of what he did, but when he did it. When a child observes the world around them, they are acquiring a base, and if that base is tainted from the offset, only despair can be built on top. Zabuza learned what it meant to be a tool, yet, even in his naivety, he could never fully submit to the fate given to his kind. Even after escaping the presence over him, he tries to usurp it claiming an ambition that takes all of the darkness for himself, perhaps out of wrath against the land that only used him, or perhaps a subliminal yearning in his subconscious, a thought testing the perception of his own existence. If he truly is more than a tool the Hidden Mist created, then he could prove it by taking this land for himself. Since he was molded by the Shinobi world, it's surely apt to prove his worth in that same setting, recreating his ultimate lesson on a massive scale, first with his comrades in the graduation exam, and eventually with those ruling over the village. Both scenarios end with him standing alone at the top. Zabuza, though, in all his blindness, could not see that the answer he sought was right in front of him, because he is not alone, not anymore. Even if Zabuza were to use him like he was once used, there's a massive distinction in Haku's actions. One sacrifice compelled out of obligation, the other born from love. Zabuza was caged by his homeland, and became a rabid dog after releasing himself from the chains that binded him. Yet Haku never feels the desire to escape from a circumstance even ending in death, because it is not for a mission, but for another. Haku dies proving the worth in human emotion. And Kakashi only bolsters the message with the leverage he gains immediately after. Zabuza cannot understand why Kakashi seems more powerful than before, when in reality, Kakashi never upgraded at all. Zabuza merely became weaker, because a part of his power, a part of him was gone forever, never to return. Whereas Kakashi is still being fueled by the comrades behind him, the resolve to protect their lives maintaining his combative prowess. For two men that grew up with similar bases, it's fitting that they would eventually clash in such a decisive setting. Kakashi had someone who taught him the value in his father's actions, but Zabuza never even gave himself the chance to listen. And it is a fragment of this very strength Kakashi utilizes that forces Zabuza to listen. One out of several comrades behind him. Yet for the first time in this arc, Naruto walks in front of Kakashi. His idea of facing the enemy a novel one. Even though both parties' objectives have changed, Naruto still sees an impeding wall in front of him. He speaks with Zabuza not because it's necessary for the mission at hand, but because Zabuza's way of life goes against everything Iruka taught him on that fateful night. It goes against the words of Kakashi's first lesson, the words that changed his base all those years ago. Yet those words were exchanged from one comrade to another, where Iruka's words are directed at a boy harboring his greatest enemy. So Naruto too would not only look at his comrades, but his enemies as well. If Naruto could be changed from the loser fox monster to Shinobi of the Hidden Leaf, then surely the Demon of the Mist could become Zabuza, a human. Naruto once a boy but forced to become a man, looks at another just like him. They are alike, both he and Zabuza, because all shinobi, no matter what land, are cursed by the same dogma. Instead of looking at Zabuza's actions, 
Naruto chooses to look at the picture as a whole, just like Iruka did when he weeped for the boy he had looked away from for so long. Naruto weeps for Haku, for Zabuza, and Zabuza weeps as well, for Haku, for his misguided self. And all it takes, all it ever took was for someone to look at Zabuza, not the demon of the mist. Naruto prevails by going a step beyond success, not defeating the enemy, but transforming that enemy into an ally. From the very start of his journey, Naruto finds his greatest strength not in his latent power, but his words. With life comes conflict. As long as there is one side, another will oppose it. As long as one cursed soul finds salvation, another will still be lingering in the darkness. And if these two sides come to know one another, they will inevitably clash. But it takes much more than mere conflict to achieve resolution. At the offset, Gara seems so unlike our main character. He talks to Sasuke as if they are peers in a different world from the rest. Yet he cannot see that he's much more comparable to Sasuke's goofy counterpart. It's because Naruto's eyes are different. Eyes that had found salvation where Gara had not. And of course he hadn't. Because Gara's salvation, his Iruka, was a facade all along. One fateful night of redemption, another of damnation. Each event only encompassing a fragment of these characters' lives, yet shaping their entire everyday existence onwards. Naruto's ideology is put to the test in the final exam. Neji's words do in fact hit home with a man like Naruto. A cursed fate. Inescapable. Doom. But it wasn't fate. It was all always circumstantial. Just like how Naruto can grin warmly now, even after experiencing almost identical pain as the man who can only muster a contorted smile. These immense distinctions arose from one mere night. And Naruto would prove this phenomenon to be true in one mere fight. Neji's initial observation is wrong. Naruto's most prominent fate has nothing to do with him being a failure, but rather a monster. What seemed to damn him long before he even had a chance to fail was what lurked inside. Neji, however, cannot see this. He cannot see the hypocritical nature of his actions when compared to his words. He cannot see Naruto's latent potential that signifies him as far from a failure. And most importantly, he cannot see a bright future for himself. As long as there is a mark on him, his future will continue to be bleak. But Naruto has a similar mark, one that also easily controls fate. Yet here, Naruto fights against that notion, using the power that once defined his cursed fate productively to prove a point. A point about having the power to change. But this final strike from our knucklehead ninja is not the end. Because here, Naruto stands, ending a combative match with a speech to the fallen. The actual contents of this exam battle having no impact on Naruto's progression. He stays again even after this victory, but what he does gain, he gains through his words. A new ally. An ally that would return the favor much later. Not because destiny compels him to protect the main family, but because he wanted to protect his cousin, his friend. Where Naruto wins this battle by taking control of the fate that binded him, Gara would lose his after letting his power control him. The fear Naruto has when faced with someone so alike, yet so different from himself is understandable. Gara, after all, is a mirror of what Naruto could very well be if it wasn't for that singular encounter. But this is all the more reason he should fight. If anyone can reach Gara, it would surely be one of the only men that can truly understand him. And understand him he does. When both are weakened, incapable of standing, Naruto uses his ultimate weapon once again. His idea of resolution. Gara would not come back an enemy, but an ally of the Leaf, and once again as the revered Kazekage. And even still, much later, this road of redemption would lead him to finding closure with his dark past. And all it takes, all it ever took, was for someone to look at Gara, not the monster of the sand. Naruto, as unconscious now as it may be, has actively been doing much more than simply winning his battles. Yet ironically, Sasuke is the first character that vocalizes a phenomenon that is similar to Naruto's current abilities, yet goes even beyond them. If one could understand everything about a person merely through an exchange of blows, then all that's left is to solve those problems, something Naruto has already been doing. But it's a process. Naruto can never do anything without that empathy. 
Empathy derived from experiencing similar pain as his adversaries. If it takes understanding to achieve resolution, then this phenomenon experienced by high-level shinobi must be the perfect solution to conflict. While it seems paradoxical to say that conflict leads to peace, it is the only way Naruto has ever saved anyone. It is through conflict that he himself was saved. Sasuke actively seeks conflict. He does so to progress. It is through strife that one becomes stronger. Can you read what's in my heart, Naruto? He taunts. Yet he does not throw those same words back at himself. He believes himself to be a great enough shinobi, but refuses to acknowledge Naruto as on par. They cannot connect because Naruto is still lacking, and lacking he is. But, unknown to Sasuke, he is lacking as well. They could not understand each other because they had yet to fully grasp themselves. Naruto had been confronted with opponents he could conveniently connect with due to his past experiences. But here, the only thing he can relate to with his rival is solitude. It's painful, yes, before a man who knows it and is willfully subjecting himself to it again. How could Naruto ever understand something as ludicrous as that? He knows what it means to be vengeful as a result of circumstance not what it means to be vengeful as a result of a calculated atrocity. This, though, is the most ironic aspect of this entire fight, because for both characters, it's actually the opposite. The true origin of Naruto's suffering was planned destruction, and the true root of Sasuke's was a circumstantial ultimatum. As I said, how can these two opposites ever connect when they cannot even distinguish the differences that shape them as diametrical in the first place? Naruto loses on this path when faced with the unknown. But Sasuke is no different. His current path too would end the same way, but it would take longer. Thus, it would be all the more painful. Naruto, failing where he always succeeded, diverges from his previous self. He can't use the Nine Tails like he did against Neji. He can't be the one to save the people around him. He can't persuade Sasuke to listen like he once had before. He doesn't even attempt to look at his opponents anymore, only looking through them. Quite similar to his rival, yes, a new avenue by which to further understand him. But if he continued down this road, even Sasuke would eventually be just another obstacle. And when two combatants view each other as mere obstacles, that is how the cycle of conflict perpetuates. As odd as it may seem, Naruto parallels his adversaries in this section of the story. Kakuzu does not see the individual, only their transactional worth. Hidan does not see a person, but instead a sacrifice to his god. Naruto does not see a lost man in a tragic world when he looks at Kakuzu, only a blockade that needs to be surmounted. All three blinded by the concept of victory. Where Naruto once looked beyond it, he can't even see beyond himself anymore. All these recent failures, the crippling gap between him and his goal, and his looming darkness that only exploits all of these shortcomings. His path takes a turn for the worse, if you can even call it a path, because Naruto is more lost than he ever was before. Even when Kabuto tries to secure common ground with his previous foe, Naruto doesn't even attempt to listen. Where he once so naturally exploited the contradictions in his opposition, he is now still riding on the failures ignited by his hypocrisy in the final valley. Kabuto's contradiction is blatant, so blatant in fact, that if Naruto even glanced in his direction, it couldn't be missed. A man who talks of finding his own identity by absorbing the identity of others. There's nothing more backwards than that. He accomplishes nothing by looking past Kabuto, learns nothing by looking past Itachi, and fails once again in retrieving Sasuke after looking past Tobi. Even previously with Kakuzu, when it seemed like he did in fact accomplish something, that too was later revealed to be more harmful than beneficial. Yet his comrade in the very same battlefield flourishes. Shikamaru, just like the others, just like every shinobi, looks through his foes. But he succeeds where Naruto does not, because Shikamaru's journey is not about his ability to understand, but rather his ability to grasp the torch that was passed on to him, maintaining that flame until another can inherit it. After enduring an outcome that leads to his worst despair, Shikamaru does not think of revenge, but a cooperative plan where he and his comrades can accomplish what his predecessor could not, to inherit and to surpass, thus leaving room for each generation to bloom more than the last. This is Shikamaru's ninja way, which is why Kakashi lectures Sasuke, but cooperates with Shikamaru, despite both targeting members of the Akatsuki. 
Revenge is a blunt tool used to carve out hatred from oneself. But Shikamaru's weapon is different, and very sharp when pointed at the enemies at hand. For those who only look at themselves as extensions of themselves, they perish by the plan of a man who sees himself as an extension of the will of fire. Hidan and Kakuzu's paths are centered around accumulating more for themselves. Kakuzu obsessed with monetary gain, Hidan obsessed with his god's graces showering upon him. Yet Shikamaru, as inherently stationary as he may be, becomes obsessed with moving forward, not for his own benefit, but for the flourishment of the ones succeeding him. And this vision locked in the future is what cements the future demise of his opposition, for all they can see is their present desires. Shikamaru's conflict ends in complete success, where Naruto's ends in success only partially, one staying true to his ninja way, the other losing sight of his long ago. Hidan and Kakuzu do not receive redemption, because Naruto had yet to redeem himself. Shikamaru redeems himself by the conclusion of this conflict, which is why it makes perfect sense that it is not only Iruka, but Shikamaru that spur Naruto forward once again. Shikamaru takes the lesson that he carried along with him through that battle and uses it again here. He can't help the world's broader problem, but his ideology can help lift the man who will. Iruka's words soften the blow, but Shikamaru's words put Iruka's into perspective. Naruto has failed many times in his recent conflicts, but that's been the narrative for the vast majority of his life. He found his hottest success streak when he stuck to his novel way of facing opposition. To achieve victory, he would have to find that path once more. But this time, Naruto would have to do more than just that, for his next enemy would require a level of maturity beyond empathy. Jiraiya, Kakashi, then Hinata. The sequential line of suffering Naruto encounters is sudden. No time to mourn Jiraiya, no time to lament not being there for Kakashi, and no time to fight against wrath when a fallen comrade lies damaged in front of him. Such is pain. A swift whimper, and then eternal silence. Something precious can dissipate in seconds, as if all those memories shared amount to merely that against the cruel fate of timeless violence. A fate Nagato witnessed twice too many, and a fate Naruto is now coming to know. A man can never be impervious to this pain, but a god, surely a god can. If pain can scar even the best of men, then it isn't absurd to say the very concept of pain can be considered divine, to take pain as a namesake, thus diagnosing divinity, the prescription to ascend pain being to experience it. Nagato believes it to have cured his mortal immaturity, so by spreading his prescription universally, then perhaps the entire world would come to mature as well. But he, Nagato, could never become pain. He could never truly become a god. Against Jiraiya, he feigns apathy for Yahiko's memory, yet he reveals his true human emotions against Naruto. I will never forget Yahiko's pain. This is not an utterance from the lips of the divine. This is not the phrase of a god immune to pain. Nagato seeks liberation from the vicious cycle of violence through violence. He believes this avenue to be righteous because he deludes the reality of his position. Those who are above pain are different when they spread it because it is aligned with purpose. A purpose called peace. But Nagato's purpose is blighted on two fronts. His first blight, a perpetuation of the same cycle he had come to despise with his actions. He was hurt, after all, and that hurt has lingered with him even now. He has never been above it. This is not a method for world peace, but a method for retribution. Retribution against the world. And this idea is only solidified with his second blight. His compromise. Nagato had given up. Any peace he could possibly acquire, even with his godly means, could only ever be temporary. After the dust settles, and the destruction is hidden by something new built on top, the masses will eventually forget the perpetrator. They will forget pain. No method will last. No peace can usurp the inevitability of conflict. At the very least, Nagato is sound on step one of the equation. He is correct. Conflict is an inevitable factor of human existence. 
This is the same reason why he, a human, is propagating so much conflict now. But Naruto? Naruto shows him a different step too. After experiencing pain, enduring it, and even enduring his preceding hatred, Naruto faces his sibling disciple with a different answer. That answer not necessarily being conveyed through his words, but his actions, or rather, his lack of action. Naruto was previously speechless when confronted with Nagato's solution, because he, much like his enemy, had yet to confront his pain. I'm going to kill you, then bring peace to the ninja world. That wasn't Naruto talking, but his hatred. Hatred for the one who killed his master, his sensei. If those were not Naruto's words, then would his hatred bring the peace he desires? No, of course it wouldn't. Naruto himself didn't believe this. Hatred merely clouded his words. He didn't hate Zabuza, didn't hate Gara, didn't hate Sasuke, and did not even hate Kakuzu. But here, Naruto is faced with a man he has every reason to despise. His wrath would be justified, just as Nagato believes his wrath towards the world to be justified. Naruto, however, does not even strike when confronted with the face of pain, because he had already struck down the true face of pain immediately before this meeting. His enemy was never Nagato, but pain. He conquered his, now it is time to help conquer Nagato's. Naruto didn't conquer his alone, after all. If it were not for Minato, Naruto would have never even had the chance. And if it were not for Iruka, he might have already crushed the leaf long before Nagato ever could. Naruto looks at his enemy, a path that was once lost, now finally retrieved. He doesn't just see a propagator of pain, but a victim as well. In order to save Nagato, he would have to reveal the answer he couldn't muster back then. It's an answer that doesn't even have a solution, but what it does have is a step that truly transcends pain. If the Shinobi Way is one defined by conflict, then it's only the first chapter of a much bigger story, because Naruto's second chapter is defined by endurance, a chapter inspired by the theme of his master's whole original story, the tale of a man who does not conform to the hypocrisy of Shinobi, those who aspire to be emotionless tools, when it is that very emotion which compels them to be emotionless in the first place, these human emotions fueling wars that necessitate tools in a ceaseless cycle, this man simply stands against a dreadful curse plaguing the world. But that alone makes it a novel story. And this hero, who aspires to attack the parasite, not its host, his name is Naruto. Uzumaki Naruto, turning fiction into reality in the midst of his opposition. He confronts Nagato with the words he once inspired. This is all his cursed soul ever needed. Someone to not only look at him, but to show him where his failings lurk. Naruto emerges as a proponent of endurance, and demonstrates clearly where the merit in it lies. And so Nagato too is saved by another, enduring his hatred to muster one last action, not against the world, but for it. If Naruto had executed his nemesis in the name of vengeance, he would have merely become the victor. But when finding resolution by reaching his opposition, he retrieves something much more valuable, both literally and metaphorically. Through Nagato, Naruto learned pain. And it is only through experiencing pain that endurance could be demonstrated here, thereby saving Nagato. Through this conflict, through this pain, maturity spawned. But it only matured with support. It only matured with endurance on both sides. And it is only when all these threads connect that mutual understanding is found. In this conflict, empathy alone was not enough to reach the lost. And soon, endurance on top of that would not be enough either. But for now, Naruto could rest easy on this growth. When he learned empathy, he was rewarded with the title Shinobi. And now, after enduring his hatred, he is rewarded with the title Hero of the Leaf. And eventually, after continuing to walk up the steps of his path, he will be rewarded with the title Hero of the World. But before that, Naruto would have to writhe with each step because the road he has chosen is one that confronts all the pain of the entire shinobi world. Naruto is not a story about the rise of an underdog. It is a story about an underdog who rises, falls, rises, falls, and rises once more to assert destiny's curse. 
Each rise and fall important because they are all checkpoints on one road, synonymous with the world. A common misconception is the story of Naruto hits a deadlock in progression by the conclusion of the pain arc. Our main character achieves what he set out to do from the beginning. This sends Naruto in a perpetual upward draft till the conclusion of the story. I urge you though, dear viewer, recall the end of an adolescent path pre-time skip. Naruto, fighting his rival with the goal of Hokage in his sights, fails. Yet, when fighting with the goal of Sasuke in his sights, succeeds. The distinction, a true understanding of himself. Sasuke's pain, the world's pain, his pain. They are all different, but they are also cut from the same cloth. The state of the world dictated their pain, and from that pain they grew. But they grew in different ways. Two men, once diametrical in their wounds, clashed with conflicting ideologies. Here, though, they are much more alike in their suffering, but still offer up answers opposed to one another. Nagato believed it was only through pain that people could understand one another, but there was a catch. This method was doomed to be transient. It wouldn't last, because suffering forms monsters in isolation. Pain can only be effective when allied with something else, and all it takes is one person to offer it to the afflicted. But the person themselves can only offer something of value once they've matured enough to see the same world as the downtrot. Pain, hatred, help, suppression, reflection, confrontation, understanding, and, finally, resolution. All of these phenomena are born from conflict. Without it, there is no misery, but at the same time, there is no resolution. A world devoid of pain is a world devoid of resolution. It is a world vacant of maturity, vacant of true understanding. For Naruto to confront these farcical solutions, though, he would have to acquire what he lacks most. To understand what led up to the scarred world before him, he would first have to understand what led up to Uzumaki Naruto. He would have to hurt himself, look at himself, and battle himself to rise once more. Who am I? It's a question everyone faces, with an answer ever so elusive. One can easily walk a road labeled peace and reach a dead end called war. The actions themselves don't capture the individual's will, because the will does not necessarily dictate action and reaction. Naruto can say he wants to achieve what Jiraiya could not, can look like he has all the tools to achieve it with power surpassing his masters before him, but prowess and idealism alone does not solve issues, especially one as gargantuan as the world's gaping wound. He's so powerful, he's grown so much, and so many people have entrusted him with making the seemingly impossible possible. But even with all this going for him, he stumbles yet again after just finding footing on this long, arduous road. Nagato knew more than Naruto. He knew so much more, in fact, that he accurately predicted Naruto's fate before his demise. Naruto will come to no war. And when he does, that's when the real battle begins. The harsh reality is the victory over pain was a mere prelude to a lesson much bigger and much harder to endure. If understanding is quintessential to begin the process of resolution, then Naruto hadn't even achieved the first step. And this idea is reinforced by Naruto's new hypocrisy. He carries it with him when he grimaces through pointless blows, carries it with him when he brushes off a friend, and carries it with him when he is faced with his past failure. Naruto proved his strength over pain, so he doubles down on this fortitude by completely subscribing to his status as the child of prophecy. But as the great Toad Sage lays out, even in the previous turmoil, that prophecy was usurped when Naruto and Nagato initiated great change together. He couldn't confront pain alone, and couldn't reach his foe without the lesson Nagato taught him. Yet he carries himself like his shoulders alone are capable enough to bear the weight of the world's pain. He's seen what that burden has done to the many he's encountered, so he makes a foolhardy effort to not let any more of that weight be distributed. He disregards that he never carried it alone in any of his battles. Disregards it is only when he endured that weight salvation was achieved. No one else can walk this road with him if their shoulders are bare. Naruto's selflessness becomes a weapon threatening his own dream. But he's not the only one in this web of contorted ambition. Paralleling him is the whole of Team 7, their faults all laid out and highlighted at the climax of the Kage Summit. Sai makes a grave error. His deduction of Naruto's resolve is completely separate from Sakura. But Sakura wouldn't know this, because Naruto wouldn't tell her, wouldn't tell Sai, wouldn't tell Kakashi. 
He can't give up on Sasuke because it would be the same as giving up on his dream. Sasuke, Hokage, and the world. All of these things, as unrelated as they may seem, are synonymous. Hokage is merely a status. It's not, I'm going to be Hokage. But instead, this is the kind of Hokage I'm going to be. Someone that can mend the broken, even if it seems futile. If he gives up on Sasuke, then he might as well give up on the world too, because the latter is far more daunting. Naruto accuses Sakura of lying to herself, but she's not. She never met one word she said. The one who forced her into this corner is none other than Naruto, because he refuses to allow anyone close to this new path he follows. Everyone else is left with only assumptions. He isn't doing this for Sakura, or even Sasuke. He's doing it for himself, because this is what he needs to do in order to become the Hokage he desires. But when a future fellow Kage tries to reach out, even in a direct way, Naruto still persists with silence. It was he who taught Gara how to connect with others. But now, Naruto is doing everything in his power to stray away Away from his own lesson. His actions betray Gara's kindness and deepen the rift in Team 7. Sakura's betrayal of her feelings is a facade, but it's a prelude to the true betrayal she initiates immediately after this debacle. Sasuke is unrecognizable to her, and it's no wonder. He, just like Naruto, is riding on newfound hypocrisy. His, though, is far more black than his rival's. Sasuke reels when Donzo justifies sacrificing the Uchiha for the Leaf's greater good, and smiles when he justifies sacrificing Karin for his greater good. He uses his hatred as a weapon, eradicates his foe with it, and hurts an outlying party in the process. The same boy who didn't know anything lying at Itachi's feet perpetuates a similar cycle of despair for a reason much colder. This freezing aura adds justification behind Sakura's kunai. She tells herself the man in front of her isn't Sasuke. But is this really the case? Sure, his actions can't be bogged down to simply misguided anymore, but it's not like there isn't a route to his madness. Contorted as his ambition has become, it's still Sasuke's path. Just because something is hard to see doesn't mean it's not still there. And it's for this very reason Sakura hesitates. She's doing this for Naruto, but he doesn't want this. And she doesn't want this. While Naruto chokes on his own toxic selflessness, it contaminates Sakura as well. If Naruto won't allow her to bear her own share of the weight, then she will carry her own cumbersome load. And just like Naruto, she crumbles. Kakashi spawns to her rescue as a false savior. He puts off airs that he is different in his solo burden. Because as sensei, it's his responsibility to mend what he previously could not. But as Sasuke blatantly points out, he's not their sensei anymore. He's so much their peer now, even his blight is the same. He doesn't acknowledge Sakura's turmoil, just like Naruto did, which leaves him blind to her haphazard devotion. He refuses to ask himself why Sasuke would commit these atrocities, instead scolding his former student for the actions themselves. He doesn't know the current Sasuke, so why would the same outdated lecture work now? He deludes himself into believing he relieved Sakura of this burden, but Sakura foolishly never let it go, and Naruto swoops in to take it all for himself again. He steps forward, in front of Sakura, in front of Kakashi. He won't let them stand beside him as he confronts the rift in their team. Naruto discards the obvious, that they are as much a part of this as him and Sasuke. But even in this matter, he persists. Sakura needs to kill Sasuke. Kakashi needs to kill Sasuke. No, he would do it. And take it one step further, he wouldn't just shoulder Sakura and Kakashi's weight, but Sasuke's as well by dying with him. How, though, is this any kind of resolution? Naruto and Sasuke make up half of their shattered team. If they were to perish, that wouldn't patch the rift, but instead make it impossible to retrieve scattered pieces. He understands his rival more than his comrades, yet still lacks a fundamental answer to resolve anything. Naruto abandons the very thing he wants for Sasuke. Sasuke remains unmoved in the stasis of darkness. Sakura opts to trust in the two she believes in the most, and Kakashi leaves the rest in Naruto's clumsy hands, all of them scattered even more after this confrontation, with Naruto falsely believing he has the magnet that will pull them back together. What does it take to rise above despair? This is the essential question for a Jin Churuki. Naruto was born into rough circumstances, yet he always had combative gifts that could be nurtured. But did those gifts help him find resolution with Nagato? Did they help him redeem Zabuza? Isn't the power he's amassed now the very reason for his recent disillusionment? Fukai lays it out bluntly, 
For those forced into the realm of outcasts, skill doesn't have a lot to do with survival. There's much greater power to draw from, a power which can only be found externally. Killer B, a Jinchuruki peer, is the first to recognize Naruto's shortcomings in this domain. Naruto aims to confront the world's hatred, but he hasn't even conquered his own. The past scar still lingers as much as ever. And it makes sense, because at no point in his journey has he directly faced his hate-filled eyes from back then. Here, though, he finally does. When he sees his other as a fake, he fails. But in his comeback, he understands who he's looking at. Since it's all him, then the rest is simple. If he still harbors hatred, then he'll accept it. It won't just disappear. It can't. Naruto doesn't say goodbye to his painful past. He embraces it. It might have been hard. He might hate what he went through. But all those memories made him who he is now. They don't fade away after Naruto acknowledges them. They become one with him again. The first step in this new path is achieved. No one is above their past, their pain, or their hatred. This action doesn't necessarily heal our hero's wounds, but it does enable the recovery process. A recovery process that leads to the perfect remedy for a wounded heart. A mother's wisdom, her love, it really can't be beat. But what Kushina provides here extends even further. Naruto's root, the very essence of his existence, is tied to his identity as the Ninetales host. And, as far as he's concerned, it's brought him nothing but suffering. Kushina puts all of that suffering into perspective, though. He didn't become a Jinchuruki out of happenstance or convenience, but because he was entrusted with a task that the people who treasure him most could not fulfill. He's had a dark hole inside him since birth. And now, it's revealed the greatest tragedy of all was it obscured the two sons that have always been with him. Now that Naruto can see them with the truth Kushina unveils, the void in its entirety is plugged away. His father stalled his vengeful heart, and his mother picked up the slack by mending it with love. With the help of others, with the weight of his past being distributed, Naruto resolves his inner turmoil. Next up, the world. Kishimoto loves pairs. Whether it's two masks, two Kyubis, two dreams, two sons, two Sharingan, or two friends. All of these parallels bounce off each other and resonate with one word. Balance. The world moves because love breeds loss, hate, and damnation. But it's only in the darkness of despair that one can experience the light of salvation. Thus, they can learn to love again. And the cycle continues on, defining the world, defining shinobi. And no one thing captures this phenomenon with the same frequency as the Edo Tensei. Sai regrets never having shown his brother the final page of his picture book. One not of conflict, like the other illustrations depict, but of union. In the hell of being forced to disconnect with human feelings, they found each other, and formed a human bond. And this bond carries over through death. The Edo Tensei might have forced Sai to face his brother, but it also allows him to patch this one lingering regret regarding him. Haku and Zabuza are used as tools for another, creating the same scenario when they were alive. They conform to the shinobi way, but Zabuza died human. This usage of the two desecrates the way they died, but it also sheds light for Haku. His death did much more than protect Zabuza's life. It saved his soul. And here, only because they are revived, feelings built up but hidden by the darkness of the world are finally conveyed. Zabuza's one regret in being unable to show Haku reciprocation is mended. From desecration comes beautiful resolution. Rasa died upon in a greater scheme. He spent his life reaching for a nation bigger than a dune of sand, but he could never obtain it. He sacrificed his wife and son to achieve greater heights for his country, but all he received in return was death. Gara, though, received so much. Insight, enlightenment, and a friend. He stands proud against his father, and the previous Kazekage can only lower his head in regret. But this regret is completely washed away by a simple recollection on the truth. One of love. This love so powerful, it even extends to Rasa, healing both father and son. The Sand Village will prosper, because the man leading it now understands what true strength is. Hanzo can be likened to many shinobi. He had a dream synonymous with our main character, but fell to the same disillusionment as the villain's Naruto comes to battle. His will withered long before his body. The words he once spoke about conviction's power to transcend the life it spawned from are forgotten, just like the person he uttered those words to. Mifune did not abandon his samurai way. When he faced death's door, he maintained being a shield for his comrades. Hanzo acknowledged this, and took this resolute action to heart. 
Had he remained a shinobi true to his own path, he would have remembered, but he forgot everything to do with his failed dream, even the regret. The disembarkment from himself leads him to slump under the darkness of his paranoia. No comrades around him, no one to sing his praises, no one to entrust with his will. The last memories he has are of his vanquisher mocking a shell of a man. When Hanzo talks of Shinobi, it isn't what he saw when he marched toward peace, because he eventually turned into the very kind of ninja he despised most. No conviction. Only a tool for the cause of survival. Hanzo used Mifune as a guinea pig to test the limits of conviction, but ironically, he was the one who lost his. After hearing Mifune's words, and seeing his conviction maintained after so long, though, Hanzo is reinvigorated to do something he never did in life, something Mifune helps him regret. He lost his dream, so it never lived on after he died. But now, he gets to entrust it with another, and earns an honorable second death that will be remembered. Itachi has much to regret about his clan, his brother, and himself. The origins of this strife come from Madara's stigma, and it is Madara's war that brings him back. Both are negative circumstances, but Itachi's revival brings about so much positive. He finds camaraderie he lacked in life through Naruto, receives salvation by Sasuke's confrontation, helps another find himself, and stops the jutsu plaguing the battlefield. All the wisdom Itachi disperses to Naruto, Sasuke, and Kabuto inspires the idea to seek more wisdom from the dead, in the belly of regret. Hashirama had a dream. It was once Madara's as well, but the one advantage the first's rival had over him was his foresight. Children would still have to fight, and wars would still be rampant after Konoha's construction. As long as humans continue to be human, conflict will persist. The village, what it represented, became surface level, just as Madara predicted. Underneath the will of fire Hashirama spawned was an ice-cold shadow of pragmatism, a chill his successors helped persist. Tobirama with his handling of the Uchiha, and Hiruzen with his aversion from the leaf's darkness. He avoided gazing into the abyss, so it only grew. He placed the entirety of the burden on Donzo, and he only became more shrouded as a result, prodding Itachi to make a decision, which ends in his clan's destruction, enticing Orochimaru closer to the dark, which would eventually erupt the leaf into chaos. Hiruzen put his full attention into preserving the light, ignoring the vast black foundation that held up his land. His blight is comparable to the god whose similar proclivity toward the light initiated the conflict that all of this darkness is rooted in, and both regret their aversion to it. Although, Hiruzen grasps redemption by working in tandem with the Man of the Night for a new dawn. Hashirama hears the tragedies that are still befalling the current times because of Madara, and regrets not understanding his friend generations ago. He regrets not being able to see what Madara could. But the silver lining is, the core of his dream is still proven valid. It is people born from the land he built that saved the world. He entrusted his young dream to the future, and it has matured into the force that fights against Madara's dream, ultimately eclipsing it. Madara is wrong, but Hashirama gets to leave him with a message of understanding, something he failed to do in their previous lives. And his words to his fallen friend are backed by the proof behind him, mirroring when he proved his words with actions at the end of the warring era. Madara, after being proven wrong for the second time in a second life, finally lets himself rest. And Minato is another soul who claims his eternal rest in this moment. Despite the epithet, Yellow Flash, he was always too late when it mattered most. He couldn't save Obito, couldn't save Rin, couldn't save Kushina, but he does save his son. And his revival helps Naruto once more. He might have been too late to do it directly, but one of the others he couldn't save before picks up the slack, a man he helped find his light once more, fulfilling his duty as sensei. Not strictly dialogue between teacher and student, but as three men who have failed so much. Minato knows there are certain feelings only a close friend can convey, so he puts the spotlight on Kakashi, entrusting him to say the words that will reunify the soul of their team. And Minato finishes patching a lifetime of regret by fulfilling his role as a father. The finale of this aid are words he was never able to tell Naruto for 17 long years. Regret is a huge theme in the war arc, and the dead aren't the only ones who propagate it. Kakashi regrets two shattered teams he failed to mend, Obito deep down regrets the path he abandoned, Madara regrets the brothers and clan he couldn't save, which is why he attempts to claim redemption by saving the world in his own way, Hagoromo regrets not adhering to balance, giving all his gifts to the light, ignorant of the shadow that decision would cast, and even Naruto regrets the words he couldn't utter all those years ago.
The merit of a ninja is not solely dependent on their physical abilities. As introduced in the beginning of the story, an ideal shinobi is one who can not only deceive, but break through deception. The fourth Okage could not uncover the deception of the world's calamity. The man behind the mask, while exuding every conceivable essence of Madara Uchiha, was only the legend and ideology. Madara Uchiha is not a man, but a motive an ideal that transforms one's whole identity, contorting it on a path toward one objective. This march toward false peace desecrating everything in its wake. For what purpose is there in crushing a land that should matter not to a man who relinquished his identity? The answer is simple. Parting with his identity is impossible. Since he couldn't forget, the next best thing was to eliminate the distraction. He could have left after accomplishing his objective, could have avoided dangerous confrontation. Yet, he chooses to let loose his wrath chooses to face a portion of his pain. Minato was only half right in his deduction. The man before him was Madara Uchiha, but only in Persona. It'd be as simple as discarding his mask to reveal the truth. Personas are just that fickle. The weight of the name Madara Uchiha is used not only to convince Obito of his separation from the world, but it is also a symbolic mask used to deceive his opponents. If he displays attributes of the legend, then they'll be convinced enough to not dig any further, because if his former master could see beyond the lies of deception, the sound of this battle would ring a far different tone. Madara used the knowledge of Obito to devise a perfect plan, yet his insistence on eliminating the past complicated what would have been a cinch to a man truly above his former self. But he wasn't. He could never be. He fails to destroy the past, fails to prove his prowess over it, and fails to accomplish the only objective that should have been relevant to Madara. But he succeeds in keeping the facade intact. The name Madara Uchiha would haunt Minato even after death. He saved his village and entrusted power to his son. But both actions would reap future consequences. Since he saw his enemy as no more than what he exuded, he was unable to halt more devastation. And since he was unable to see the Nine Tails as little more than a potential asset for Naruto, he perpetuated more destructive hatred. But, despite these shortcomings, Minato didn't fail, because his accomplishments in this turmoil would foster a shinobi that could break through the ultimate deception. It would foster a shinobi that not only halts, but mends hatred spanning generations. This shinobi, as straight shooting as he may be, so impractical as to wear an orange jumpsuit in a world where the standouts are easy targets, he ironically is the ninja who will break the illusionary mask with the help of detrimental power he turned beneficial. But before any of this could happen, Naruto too would have to face his past. Individuality creates dreams. Dreams create hope. Hope creates despair. This is the ideology of the man behind the mask. A man who claims to be no one, yet wears the baggage of Madara Uchiha's name over his face. For he who should have abandoned everything, why the constant attempts at validation? Why let the past linger? The answer is simple. The past could never be abandoned. He tries to fight it away, but it defeats him time and time again. He failed to destroy his past 17 years ago, and on the battlefield he created, it catches up with him. The master who shared his old dream, and the woman who entrusted him with a part of her own. He might have eradicated their presence, but their souls lived on through their offspring. And this son comes to remind the masked man who he was. It's not that he left the past behind because of its darkness, it's that he carries that darkness with him because he can't let go of the past. And the reason why is simple. The past holds everything dear to him. Despite saying ill feelings are meaningless in a world soon to be null, when his mask comes off, he lashes out at Kakashi for his failure. Even still though, Obito mocks Kakashi for even alluding that Rin is the sole reason for his actions. Yet, she is. It's not about lost love, but lost light. Rin symbolized something more than a love interest. She was a representation of the world's benevolence. In the cold hell of the Third Great Shinobi War, she offered solace that not only healed injuries, but healed the heart. When Obito was hurt, she patched his wounds. When he was uneasy, she pushed him forward. His dream that looked so far away always seemed closer when she was at his side. It was the same for Minato because of Kushina's brilliant headstrong nature, and it was like this for Obito because of Rin's constant affirmations. But since she's gone, he tries to fill even that role himself, constantly stumbling trying to validate his new path through Naruto, when it was so seamless before with someone else maintaining that role. 
He disregards that light could have been retrieved had he only reached out. Disregards the fog that loomed in front of him wasn't necessarily innavigable. It was the stain of conflict that created his hell, so he initiates more of it to create his heaven, even if it means spawning more hell for everyone else. All of this destruction to forge a shortcut toward a world of peace. A shortcut someone illuminated with a lamp post for him. That old light that once did the same thing for a long and arduous road would be replaced with a false gleam of paradise. Obito felt affection for the world when he looked at Rin, and feels disdain toward it when he thinks of Madara. His words, his dream. Obito would not only internalize these things, but let them devour him. The world that was once so bright is a void without that precious foundation. An idea mirrored by Obito's personal dimension. A place where there are only foundations, but nothing built on top. A blank space building toward a hopeless future. Both what Obito sees in the current world, and what his fake world of dreams would ultimately be. His old luminescence that propped him up is replaced with the cataclysm that shrouds his being, with Obito falsely believing it keeps him firm on his feet in the same way. And this shaky ground is displayed every time he tries to face the past he abandoned, and every time he uses Naruto to affirm his new journey. A man who displays his old characteristics, ideology, and dream. A man who displays the past Obito. In this reflection, Obito yearns to see the same transition he suffered. The path of Hokage was not sufficient to save what held up his world, so he would hold up his own new world on a new path of godhood. He needs to see the last embers of that esteemed title die out with Naruto, because it is a part of the past he can't let go of. And he can't let go of it because he can never stop loving it. After all, it was a world filled with hope. There's a reason Obito yearns to return to it in a dreamscape. He doesn't want to be the savior of the world. That is Madara Uchiha's dream. He wants to reclaim the past he lost. One where the light of hope was still alive. One where that symbolic beacon didn't die out in birth despair. When being the savior meant absolute detachment and his memories severed, Obito actively fought against this notion to retrieve them, even if it meant preserving the pain. He couldn't disconnect from the past when he was Madara, and still can't after becoming a god. Both farcical appearances expose his foundationless floor, his inability to detach from the world. What an Uchiha ghost posed as essential to reach the dreams of a far future. However, both the self-proclaimed savior and his inheritor walk this road in the first place because of their worldly scars, scars acquired in the past. All of this suffering spawned from Obito Uchiha's dream of Hokage, so he would fulfill his promise to Rin by saving the world through his new dream. One where saving the world is only an afterthought, when it should be in the forefront of his mind had he stayed true to the man Rin supported. But he died with the support she offered. Or, at least, he thought that support died. Had he known there were still others waiting to come together and fulfill that role, had he known she was still watching, supporting him through the suffering all the while, he wouldn't have abandoned Hokage. Naruto is the same. When he faces the despair Obito causes, whether it be his childhood circumstances or the death of his comrades, he wavers in the same way. He would have easily joined Obito had it not been for the numerous supports at his side. One died, but another came to his rescue, just like how it was for Obito. Only, the paralyzing distinction is, Madara is a false savior. Obito is entrusted to be the plank Madara could later walk over, where Naruto is entrusted to be the shield of conviction standing in front of his many supports. One duped into being a tool for someone else's purpose, the other consoled into becoming the man who can truly help save the world. These two are almost exactly the same. The only difference is the support they have, a common occurrence with Naruto's enemies, and it persists up to the final battle. Naruto's luckiest streak was never his genetics, birthright, or circumstances. It is his comrades. And not only did this shinobi acquire them by enduring the hardships that maintaining his convictions brought, but this refusal to give up has matured him into a man capable of seeing this one distinction in his enemy. He breaks the illusionary mask of deception his father could not, and acknowledges the pained face behind it. It's the face of his enemy, the face of the man who initiated his life of suffering. But that doesn't matter to Naruto, not anymore. He's faced his pain twice before already, and healed that past scar with the remedy of love. Since it's all healed, since he's confronted and accepted his past, he's able to shatter the shell of Madara, and unveil Obito's heart. It's a heart Obito's convinced he no longer has. A heart he tried to rip out to escape its wound. All it did, though, was strip the light he had left in him, leaving nothing but a void of residual pain. It could never be escaped. Similar to the man who took pain as a namesake in an attempt to be above it. 
and, identical to his fellow traitor, he too would abandon the Akatsuki's goal and make amends for his mistakes near the end of his road. What got him here is the same man who guided Nagato to commit the same action. All Naruto had to do was look at Nagato. All he has to do is look at Obito. The rest is easy. To look beyond one's hatred to see the individual. This is the hardest challenge of all. And it's a challenge Naruto proves he has mastered with this confrontation. He looks at the man who killed his parents, his comrades, and started a war. And extends the hand of reconciliation. A hand that, if accepted, will not only bring his side peace, but the opposing party as well. A hand that leads to true resolution. If Obito can't accept it, accompanied by Naruto's words alone, then the words of a friend who's tried to live in the dark world he abandoned will get him there. Kakashi had resolved to eliminate the current Obito to preserve his memory of the old Obito, but Naruto had different plans to reclaim the old Obito. And what's better, not only does he push his enemy toward this goal, but he enables Kakashi to pick up the slack. It's not that he has complete faith in the survival of Naruto's ninja way, it's that he has complete faith he and others will help Naruto maintain it. Something Obito now sees he too would have experienced had he only shown his face to the world once more. And the two scarred men reach the destination of this foggy winded road together, redeeming their past failures by doing their utmost to preserve the future. A future Obito not only sees in Naruto, but Kakashi as well. And he returns the favor to the two who filled the hole in his heart by saving both their lives. And the story comes full circle. Two parents throwing themselves to the gallows to protect their son. Two teammates placing themselves at death's door to protect that same light. The calamity that Naruto needed to be shielded from back then was Obito. Now, he is one of those many shields. The poison Obito administered back then, it plagued and tormented Naruto's existence. But even that darkness, his personal blight, Naruto transforms into medicine. Medicine that helps him shield his comrades in the same way. And when the real Madara robs this medicine from him, it is Obito who retrieves it. The sickness he permeated through Naruto's life, he takes it back and delivers it once more to his master's son, this time as a cure. The monster and calamity return as medicine and savior. The negatives of the past mature into future positives, converging onto a present of balance, true harmony. The enemy that initiates the world's greatest turmoil becomes one of the greatest assets in ending it all because one shinobi decided to extend his hand. And to this shinobi, Obito entrusts with his dream, the final words of a man who dies a true ninja. Just like Asuma, just like Minato, just like Jiraiya, just like Itachi, just like Nagato, just like Neji. All of them died in trusting something after a lifetime of mistakes. So, just like all of these great ninja, Obito too is nothing but awesome. Connections are easy to form, but hard to sever. If love will inevitably lead to loss, pain, hatred, and despair, then all the more reason to embrace the cycle, because it doesn't necessarily end there. If one is on the brink of destruction, the only path forward is reconstruction. And on this road of salvation, new connections form, and love is reclaimed. Enlightenment is sought not through detachment by severing stubborn bonds that will inevitably lead to pain, but by accepting the balance that governs human emotion, embracing both the positives and negatives that shape the world. When Sasuke explains cooperation was only achieved because of a common enemy, he disregards the new connections that cooperation brought about. And a microcosm of this phenomenon is showcased with Gara and Shukaku. A common enemy and Madara stands before them, so they unify their powers. And a new perspective spawns through this unification, one that echoes to the past. A withered monk whose name was forgotten, and a trapped beast infused with malice, with only each other to keep company. The monk did not ask to be a martyr for his land's protection, just like Shukaku didn't ask to be the insurance for this security. The world robbed them of free will. So, Shukaku understandably curses it. He curses the world humanity created. Just like the villains our main character faces off against time and time again. And, just like Naruto, the monk comes to eventually accept the world, not accepting its darkness, but accepting its totality, enduring the dark to see the light. The monk showcases to Shukaku his acceptance for his circumstances, the human world, and the monster inside him, which spawns hope. 
a tunnel of light displaying a brighter tomorrow. One Shukaku cannot see, because he still has yet to accept the past's darkness. Thus, it shrouds his vision of the future. But even in this pitch black cell, the monk's acceptance persists, breaching the heart of a scarred beast. The monk treats his prison mate as a friend, so Shukaku reciprocates with words of the heart as well. Words that breach his companion's heart likewise. Through the monk's acceptance, he finds Shukaku's heart. It was always there, after all, ready to be discovered. It's only natural most cannot see each other's hearts initially, because human souls are like reflecting water. People often speak or act the opposite of their true feelings, but fundamentally, people's hearts wish to connect with and accept each other. Is all of this sounding familiar? And when you combine the two characters for acceptance and heart, love is born. Love for the past, love for hardships, love for the world, and love for each other. None of this can be achieved through detachment, only first through acceptance. Naruto accepts Nagato's pain so his heart can remember his love for the world. He accepts Obito as a failed Hokage so his heart can find his lost love. Hashirama accepts Madara's failed dream so their hearts can reach the opposite shores. And, of course, Naruto and Sasuke accept each other's past to unify their hearts for a future filled with love. And a similar resolution would bloom for Shukaku. The monk was right. There are many humans like him. Gara accepts his life as a Jin Churuki because it was only through this suffering that he found his most valuable friend. And on this same path of acceptance, Ross's heart reflects the love that was hidden from Gara, which completes the journey of redemption for both father and son. Since Gara's accepted the past, he can unveil Shukaku's heart, showcasing a reciprocated love for an old companion. The monk's kin might have forgotten his name, but Shukaku always remembered. <laughs> It's fitting, Naruto's first opponent in the war is the man who once carried the same blight. Itachi immersed himself in solitude as a self-sacrifice. Since he put the entire weight of his clan on his shoulders, he inadvertently distributed useless baggage to his precious younger brother. Sounds familiar, right? It's the same effect Naruto had on Sakura and Kakashi. Itachi failed. And he acknowledges his failure not only with his words, but his actions. The jutsu he had planned to cast on Sasuke after his death is omitted. Since his road of solitude led to nothing but further suffering, he opts to share what he once considered his sole burden. If he put Sasuke under a forced genjutsu to resolve the current turmoil, he'd be the same as Madara. And if Naruto keeps obsessively relying on his power alone, he too would resemble that mass of darkness all the same. Itachi is quick to recognize his shortcomings, and quick to understand they mirror Naruto's. His eyes, once blind to the missteps of his path, now see more than they ever have before or after death. The road of failure sowed seeds for future success. It was the same with Nagato, and it would be the same for the calamity that initiated this war. Itachi's newfound insight enlightens Naruto, and even enlightens Sasuke. Despite bearing witness to the rotting fruits of his labor, he doesn't scorn his path. He accepts failure, accepts his role in the war, and accepts Sasuke despite his plans for the leaf. Since he's accepted everything, he is able to see clearly. This revival allows him a chance to make one final action for the leaf. And most importantly, it allows him to make the right decisions. By entrusting his wish, he found the camaraderie he lacked in life. And by telling the truth to Sasuke, he dissolves the manipulative path he started. Now, he can forgive himself. No hatred, no lamentation, only love in his final moments. All of these emotions directed at his younger brother with the transparency he's always deserved. For the first time in Sasuke's life, a member of his clan didn't treat him like a child or use him as a tool in a misguided plan. And this truth inspires Sasuke to seek more truth, the importance of this newfound task dwarfing the relevance of old conflicts. Orochimaru failed, and just like Itachi, Sasuke's path exposed his failings. They both desired power, but Sasuke always had something Orochimaru lacked. It isn't necessarily the genetics he boasted about before slaying his master, but a purpose. Power for power's sake is hollow. Sasuke could rapidly progress, because his powerful eyes were always locked on a task in front of him. Even being as distorted as his vengeful road was, the end goal was at least always clear. 
In contrast, what did Orochimaru plan to do once acquiring all jutsu? What did he want to do with that wealth of knowledge? Well, no one knows, because he didn't know himself. In watching Sasuke, though, everything becomes clear. Power has hurt and blinded him, but the things he placed in front of him propelled him forward despite that. He stayed in motion, where Orochimaru succumbed to the paralysis of death. It is Sasuke's continuous shifts that dictate Orochimaru's demise and revival, so the snake would observe where the hawk descends. This new answer sparks cooperation in an old foe, and its destination would lead to more cooperative peace in the future. Like Naruto, Sasuke had begun to unveil his own form of resolution. It would lead him to the same battlefield as his rival, enlighten another soul who observes him intently, help in washing away three masses of darkness, and foster a conclusion that showcases where Naruto's rise leads. Entrusted to be the savior of the world, and, on the opposite spectrum, entrusted to be a forthright Uchiha, where Naruto would falter time and time again with what he inherited, Sasuke would stay consistently resolute. After all, unlike his rival, he had seen the ones who entrusted him with the future. The future of the Uchiha clan. He witnessed many times that this future would rest on the back of his older brother, but despite that reality constantly being affirmed, Sasuke wanted that privilege for himself. His father, holding the reins of that position, favored Itachi, and Sasuke, being young, envious, and naive, struggled to obtain the same status in his father's eyes. But, even in the beginning of this long road, this goal, in of itself, would become a facade, for Itachi was only a candidate in ability. The rest was his own solo venture. Sasuke, wanting to achieve leadership in his clan by matching against and eventually eclipsing his kind older brother, receives a dose of reality in the form of a manipulative poison given to him by a ruthless man he didn't know. His brother Itachi, his goal, the very symbol of the Uchiha, he becomes distorted. What Sasuke rivaled against was never there in the first place. All he loved gone. His future robbed from him. But beyond this darkness was even more despair, for this hell trickled down. Itachi willingly robbed himself of everything before doing the same to his brother, and selfishly steered him toward a new ambition, a hollow replacement for what Sasuke had before. Itachi would still be his goal, but this time it was all for a purpose someone else instilled in him. Itachi stripped Sasuke of everything and placed him in the palm of his hand. No matter what new light revealed itself to Sasuke, this shadow would remain attached. And Itachi needed this darkness to remain profound, for his new goal was to die by his brother's hands. Guilt and manipulation twisted together to force a path of revenge. This is the origin of Sasuke, starting with Uchiha and ending with Itachi. No matter what is lurking behind him, though, his root remains constant. No matter how shrouded in darkness Sasuke becomes, it's all coming from his inner feelings. His love for his family, his love for his clan, and, slowly but surely, his love for his comrades. Itachi could never hinder this process as long as Sasuke was close to them. Behind an aloof gaze are thoughts constantly ruminating about his loss, and how to never lose it again. It's these thoughts that manifest outwardly with action more and more. It transforms Sakura from a girl with a naive perspective about the cute boy in class to a kunoichi who loves the man who would sacrifice himself for those he holds dear. It transforms Naruto from a boy with a hollow purpose to a man who understands why he walks on the road he chose. What Sasuke illuminates for these two is invaluable, but ironically, the light expelling from him can never reach his own eyes. Any chance he receives is always foiled by circumstance or manipulation. And the first instance of this comes in his first real mission. Sasuke sacrifices his future for the life in front of him. In the heat of battle, with an impossible ultimatum, he doesn't even pause to consider how much more valuable his life is compared to the loser who has yet to know why he fights. Naruto was exposed to a glimpse of purpose with Haku's words, but Sasuke's action contextualizes everything. It's not the first time someone's done this for Naruto, and they would not be the last. If one cannot find purpose in war, then naturally, they should find meaning in camaraderie, or else become a rabid dog. A vow to protect those around you until your final breath. It's an ideal their sensei displayed faith in, and one Sasuke commits to here. He shows humanity, but this process ultimately earns him nothing. 
Because unlike Naruto, he never gets to witness the end of these means. He never has the privilege to see his enemy unmasked. Haku dies performing the same action as Sasuke, and even before this, his true face revealed the burden of all the power he acquired in life. This power is special only when he uses it for Zabuza, otherwise it's just a curse. The lives of these two scarred ninja unmasks the shinobi condition and reveals it all ultimately manifests from human emotion. The ideal shinobi is supposed to be an emotionless tool, but it's because of Haku's immense feelings for Zabuza that he's able to perform his duty as a tool till his last breath. And it's because of Zabuza's feelings for Haku that he's able to see the facade in his way of life. Humans can never cut away their emotions, no matter their history, the wounds they carry, or their depravity. They can never find a blade sharp enough to sever the weight of the past. Sasuke would eventually try to be the very sword that does this for the world, but perhaps if he'd had the luxury of witnessing the end of two similarly cursed men, he might have understood something he would later not. The world never gave him a chance to see a correct path, at least one without distortion, so inevitably he would avert his eyes from it entirely. And the cycle continues. A showcase of overwhelming force in the form of solitude. Yet, Sasuke never gets to witness the transition, offering so much more. Not until it's too late. A wavering journey that gets stamped out by the man who forced poison down his throat. Don't you remember? Comrades are for but one purpose. To nurture a bond so it can be severed. Thus, power is obtained. Power from pain. Power to kill me. This is the new mantra that ruminates in Sasuke's mind, a voice resonating not from his core values, but from the shadow Itachi attached years ago. He had been constantly battling it, so it wouldn't consume him. But from his vantage, this struggle only held him back, so he decides to break free, to be ensnared by his indecisiveness no longer. Instead of teetering between two paths, he would commit to isolation. A painful sacrifice, sure, but it's far better than sacrificing nothing only to be stuck between crossroads. His rival has found immense success in conforming to one resolute path, so Sasuke emulates that strength, and in effect, receives power even greater. The end of his road is clear, after all, where Naruto is yet to consider what kind of Hokage he will be. Yet, just like his friend, Sasuke lacks something fundamental to reach his desired destination. No matter how cumbersome the shadow veiling him becomes, it can't pierce his core. No matter Itachi's words, Sasuke will always remain Sasuke. Naruto fails to retrieve his friend, and Sasuke fails to sever the past as a sacrifice for power. Naruto can't achieve his goal because he has a gap to fill, where Sasuke would have to fundamentally change himself to reach the conclusion of solitude. One goal feasible, the other impossible. And this would be the last time Sasuke looks at and acknowledges a foe for a long, long time. His reunion with Naruto, although Sasuke once conceded ground to him, it doesn't seem to have mattered. If anything, Naruto's pathetic display is below that of what he demonstrated in the final valley. He didn't understand then, and still doesn't understand now. Nothing has changed. Sasuke's acknowledgement didn't make a shred of difference. But what he doesn't know, though, is that this is only because the man he looked at then had yet to develop the necessary tools to reciprocate. Mutual understanding isn't necessarily an impossibility. Sasuke sees a withered ghost of the past, so he decides to look through him, literally, to the source of his power. Not only is it shrouded in darkness surpassing his own, but it's an aura threatening unimaginable depth. All of it found at his rival's core. This malice-ridden beast is Naruto's power. How rich for the man who once preached about Sasuke's incorrect path to be reliant on this mass of dark energy while storming his own. His words have lost any weight, so Sasuke strips them away. He leaves his former comrade distraught and wears an expression of vindication. Outmaneuvering Orochimaru, blitzing through Deidara, Sasuke finds himself in a similar scenario as his former self, three others he can rely on to support him, his humanity still intact, but the goal closer than ever before. When the past knocks at his door, he shatters it, and moves on without so much as a glance, an enhanced vision looking through a tube Itachi created, one that was always going to backfire. Sasuke would inevitably point his tunneled vision somewhere else after his older brother. The ultimate plan was doomed to fail. 
He stays true to his task when given an ultimatum. Together with them, or against him solo, Sasuke defaults to the shadow entangling him and stands before the object of his hatred alone. He has grown confident in his eyes, ones unpolluted by weighty power like the man before him. But this confidence is his bane. He has pride in abilities that only hurt him, that are only available to him because he's been damaged so much. Yet he immerses himself in the same carnage that defined his clan's greatest blight. He wears the Uchiha's pride on his back, and wears their sins likewise. Itachi detached from it all long ago, but this doesn't necessarily make him better. After all, he is blind to how fruitless his ambition is, just like the one he manipulates. Love versus apathy, hatred versus love. They both have two sides, one that they show to each other, and one that they keep close to themselves, hidden away. Had Itachi only shown the love he veils, this battle between brothers wouldn't need to happen. If only people were able to show their guts before war, then bloodshed might be deterred. Itachi is wrong, and his incorrect actions have steered Sasuke into being invalid as well. Even if they share the same blood, they can't see the heart that pumps it. They can't see each other for what they really are. This is why Sasuke would later regret his actions, and Itachi would later regret underestimating his brother's love. It is that love that got Sasuke here, and it is love that will contort him further after this farcical death match. They both overestimate what they can see, both underestimate the depth of their opponent's psyche, and both plaster on satisfied smiles that later prove to be as meaningless as the fight that summoned them. And a new shadow spawns. More manipulation striking at Sasuke's core. Obito knows how to do it so well because the same was done to him. Thus, the cycle continues. Know their pain, and you can either understand it or exploit it. Knowing something isn't the same as understanding it, but knowing is enough to exploit. And so, the chasm becomes a rift. The truth with a sprinkle of lies, all told in a precise way to lead an Uchiha brethren to the same cursed fate that defines their crest. But this too is a mere microcosm of Shinobi as a whole. Their blight isn't different, only exaggerated. Sasuke learns to love Itachi again. Yet, just like what started this dim route, this love transforms into hatred. Hatred for his brother because he robbed him of everything. Hatred for the leaf because they robbed him of his brother. The home that obscured a life in the shadows was the shadow all along. Itachi could seamlessly infiltrate it on that day because they were one and the same. Both had dark secrets. Both hurt Sasuke. And now that hurt has become a gaping wound, threatening to drown not just the leaf in Sasuke's blood, but the world if they are to obstruct him. He didn't arrive at the world's nexus alone. Paralleling his actions before with Itachi, with his target being so close, he shakes his team off. The reason why, between then and now, is all the difference. He needed to face Itachi alone then. Now, he doesn't need a tool that can't keep up. Where before they were comrades, equally sharing Sasuke's burden with him, to which he acknowledged, now he subjects them to the shinobi condition. If the tool's blunt, who cares? They're just tools, after all. And a new tool can always be acquired. Maybe, just maybe, if he could have seen the conclusion to this mentality all those years ago with his own eyes, the image of two scarred faces would penetrate his abyss. But he never saw how they died. He never saw why they died. All he saw was the thing he knew all too well. Death. And that is why he's here at the Nexus. To wreak more death. It was done to him. Now he will do the same. On and on until he breaks. For that is what an Avenger is. This light is only blinding, the words echoing in it only a faint ring, because the emission and reverberation come from false means. Sasuke needed someone to save him when he was a child, needed someone to save him then, and needs someone to save him now. But neither of the men who stood before him wanted to do that, and the man who stands before him now can't. Sasuke radiates so much darkness, and Naruto so much light. It's almost sickening how diametrical they are, on the surface. Sasuke is only this depraved because he loves so much. He has so much light in him that has been obscured, forced to be there only to cast a horrific shadow. And not by his will, but first by his, now by his. 
Sasuke uses his comrades, and he's been used all the same. The manipulated learns from the manipulators, a tool wielding tools, all to pierce what buried his luminescence. One grave digger gone, but one isn't enough. It's never enough to make up for all that lost light. His rival can't understand the depth of his pain because he hasn't even acknowledged his own. His core. These two aren't so unalike. Smothered beneath Naruto's radiance is a dark hole that mirrors Sasuke's outward gloom. They aren't diametrical, but perfectly harmonized. A center of black, but a shell of white. A center of white, but a shell of black. Yin and Yang. Perhaps this is why they, for a moment, achieve Ninshu. For the world does not abide by pure benevolence, but balance. As scarred as they both are, as wrong as they both are, their clash has still managed to foster a fraction of union. A moment of peace spawns from tense conflict. But unlike Yin and Yang, the two halves lack the conjoining thread. True harmony is only found when the two parts can function as one. And when this happens, there is no longer simply positive and negative, but one symbol that defines it all. How they can do this? The missing thread? It's the acknowledgement of their cores. Leaving a lone trail separate from the many, the lost comrade finds himself at a crossroads. The initiator, Itachi. Where the final battle in his previous life was a farcical death match against Sasuke, the final battle in his life's second chance pairs him with his younger brother, and they face down a man that shares their greatest shortcoming. It took Itachi another life to understand, but the foe in front of him and the sibling next to him haven't. They have yet to acknowledge themselves. Even after Itachi conveys where the power in his trump card jutsu lies, Sasuke looks through the moral. He can only see Itachi, what he was back then, what he did. He can't see the Itachi right in front of him, the one who exudes regret for not acknowledging what he was, the one who defeats his foe by forcing him to look at himself. Kabuto could only see the amalgamation of power he could be, severing the part that made him an individual as a consequence. He believed his true heart died with her, but it's still alive out there, somewhere, ready to be discovered. He couldn't find it, though, because what found him first was manipulation, and he embraces the tool he becomes. All until he's of no further use. Now that there's nothing to serve, he becomes a false master, attempting to surpass a lord of emptiness. Vapid power. Power for the sake of movement. Movement without a destination. The wind Orochimaru yearned to be would never attribute to anything, because it lacked a reason to blow. Kabuto doesn't examine the fundamentals of his master's ninja way. If he did, he wouldn't have attempted to pursue the same fruitless path. He instead replicates Orochimaru's means, and becomes obsessed with surpassing him. Someone else's dud of an ambition, with Kabuto's consciousness nowhere in sight. Orochimaru used him, and he becomes wrapped up in darkness, incapable of acknowledging himself. Just like Sasuke, manipulated by Obito, becoming his tool, sinking deeper into an abyss all the while. He can't acknowledge himself, and he can't acknowledge Kabuto is the same. But Itachi helps Sasuke find a semblance of clarity with the truth he always needed, and he shares his love that resonates with Sasuke's core. Ah, yes, he remembers what it feels like to love, to be loved. He'd only immersed himself in the opposite for so long, Hatred gave him false comfort, but the reunion of love gives Sasuke an intriguing discomfort. He's reminded of why he started this tainted path, and it all traces back to Shinobi. He can see himself again, one man among the cursed many. Why did Itachi suffer? Why did his clan suffer? Why does he suffer? Hatred alone never got him this close to seeing what started Uchiha Sasuke, what is buried somewhere beneath his shell. For the first time in a long time, Sasuke looks beyond himself. He broadens his scope. And all it ever took were genuine words to ignite this development. No harm, no trauma, no manipulation. Only the truth and love. A small helping hand shows itself to Sasuke, and he takes full advantage of its insight. And these insightful questions lead to an old enemy. Sasuke displays his keener eyes by exposing the depth of Orochimaru's actions. There was another reason for his obsession with the leaf's destruction. And, like his former student, he might have yearned to see it burn down for the wound it gave him rejecting his way, denying him the seat he deserved. The will of fire did not burn bright enough to ensure anyone's survival, even children. So he chose a solution that would, but the process consumed him, turning an understandable path into a twisted obsession. 
He rejected the way of his peers, and they in turn rejected his. There couldn't be no animosity after all that. Orochimaru might have deluded himself into thinking his plan was a mere whim, but Sasuke has experienced enough to know better. No matter how monstrous Orochimaru becomes, he's still fundamentally human. Animosity isn't something that can just be shaken off. Sasuke knows this better than anyone. He's begun to look at others, to acknowledge the essence of a person veiled by their thick exteriors, much like Naruto. But unlike his rival, he has yet to do the same for himself. And this gap will remain until the final battle, one that takes place on top of history, a history of perpetual conflict. Sasuke seeks dialogue from one of the men who laid out the framework for the current era's conflict. But instead of an explanation, he receives a story, one all too familiar. A tale of two friends who try and fail to form a connection, only to become enemies engaged in mortal combat. Their attempt at union created a foundation for the future, but it also spawns a calamity that now threatens to destroy it all. The dream of a future is usurped by the dream of a far future. That childish ambition nests in futility. Other lands simply built their own unified sectors and labeled the other villages enemies. Battles between clans became great wars between nations, and children would still be forced to become adult killers. One of these young victims claims the name Madara and walks through the world to create a new one. The real Madara certainly created the circumstances, but they were only made possible because of the era's climate. Nothing changed. The scale just became larger. Hashirama could see the future of the village, but as Madara asserts when they were kids, his eyes are better. He saw beyond the settlement they built, and what it meant for peace, and Madara only confirms Hashirama's short-sightedness in their final battle, defaulting to the safety of the village overall, regardless of the darkness that may fester as a result. It is this same ideology that shaped his successor, molded Danzo, afflicted Hiruzen, forced Itachi's hand, and damned Sasuke. The past's voyage to reach the light has cast an overbearing shadow on the present. The pieces fall in place. Sasuke has his answer. And it's an answer destiny predicts, because it leads him to the other half of his fate. Now, the prophecy would be put to the test. One god seeking stability, split into light and shadow. And it is these two polar opposites operating together that gives rise to all things in the universe. Madara's interpretation versus Hagoromo's hope. The previous god sought stability through Ninshu, but Ninshu was forgotten long ago. Some, though, recall its remnants. Sasuke did in the final valley, and he and Naruto achieved the semblance of it during the Kage summit. It isn't gone, hard to see may be, but as long as Chakra exists, there's always a potential for deeper understanding between people. Where before it was a direct link, now it's something more complicated. But just because something's harder to grasp doesn't mean it's futile. While Ninshu might have helped connections and bypassed conflict, Ninjutsu has proven its potential to lead to the same resolution. Only the depth is far greater. Conflict showcases things peace could never. Ninjutsu breeds conflict, but peace always precedes conflict. With the transition from conflict to peace, a far more well-rounded comprehension spawns. One knows an entirely different side of a person through war, and this knowledge will breed contempt, anger, pain, and hatred. But if endured, the preceding understanding becomes that much more expansive. Ninjutsu brought with it catastrophe, but it also forged far greater potential than Ninshu ever posed. Madara rejects the blighted world that strayed away from Ninshu, yet he takes pride in his level of ninjutsu, claiming the power he wields is his and his alone. When he would later reveal, Chakra came from a foreign source, longing to end conflict, yet reveling in shinobi battles all the same. He rejects Chakra, yet he festers in the spoiled power until his is the greatest, in order to rid it from everyone else. Madara and Madara alone would be in possession of Chakra, an aspiration that led to the downfall of the rabbit goddess, and he would use it to connect everyone in one dream. Surprisingly similar to Hagoromo's failed ambition, Ninshu for everyone to seamlessly connect with all. But true understanding is not that simple. There are no shortcuts on this path. Hmm, that phrase sounds familiar, doesn't it? Madara essentially wants to create yet another shortcut. While Hagoromo was blind to what his path was, Madara willingly embraces his farcical peace. And it's no wonder, for he lost his ability to empathize long ago. After his siblings perished, after his clan turned their back on him, he was alone. The perfect scenario for darkness to fester, and dark plans to seep out. 
It was inevitable the world would curse him, for it curses everyone living in it. The only way to save it, the only way to stabilize the incessant rumbling, is to have both light and shadow. But since Madara had forgotten cooperation after loss and betrayal, he interpreted the two sides to come from only one. If he is shadow, then he would take in light. He battles it for this purpose. However, his back is taken. The back he was confident he'd never leave open. He planned for his victory. But in his own words, nothing ever goes as planned in this cursed world. So the breaks are commenced, but he forgot how to trust. So he could not entrust. Therefore, he defaults to what he can always count on. He can't trust humans, but he can trust the human condition. He leaves a second Madara to eventually reclaim him. Even when it's not his power alone swinging the pendulum, he maneuvers it like it is. The same self-righteous path Indra stormed, and Madara fools himself into thinking his is different simply because he took in a part of the other brother. The Rinnegan is born, a declaration of godhood, but he still blazes a trail of solitude that yearns to take in everything for himself. He never usurped the fate of the chakra attached to him, even after it left. The one it's attached to now stands against him. This man become farcical god after being wounded by the past, discarding the past, returning from the past, and rescinding his human status, comes face to face with the future, one that was entrusted by a fallen warrior. Guy represents the conclusion to Hashirama's dream. The will of fire burns bright, bright enough to burn enemies and burn oneself. But those flames also act as nourishing rays that provide energy for another blooming generation. Guy sacrifices his remaining fire to buy time for fresh flames to be fanned. And it is this desperate struggle that allows Naruto and Sasuke to return with opposite infernos. They create a heat wave that would eventually sear away Madara and his dream. He entrusted nothing, instead internalizing everything beneficial into himself. Thus, there's no one he can rely on to back him up except himself. And even one of these shadows betrays him in the end. Madara's path ends with him, while Hashirama's carries on well after his existence fades. A way of shinobi that started with the first Okage, carried out by Gai, and shows its greatest potential through what his sacrifice allows to blossom. One god of light and shadow versus a man of light and a man of shadow. Time to put the interpretations to the test. The prelude to this clash makes all the difference. Not just Guy's actions, but the actions of the two he carved out a battleground for. Naruto showcased the fruits of acknowledging his past and healing his pain by helping Obito do the same, thereby granting him a second chance and new power, this newfound energy surpassing the previous era. Conceptions about what sacrifice entails? Naruto supersedes them thanks to the time Guy bided for his transcendence. Naruto enables him to continue watching the new blooming generation he helped foster. Sasuke, once blinded by manipulation, can see something in front of him clearly for the first time. He, like the five Kages in this war, opts to cooperate against a common enemy, someone whose plan would ruin his new dream. It is by his will the world will change, not Madara's. And this cooperation reminds another of time's effect on stigma. Tobirama was wary of the Uchiha. He was wary of Sasuke because he's an Uchiha. And Sasuke is a victim of his clan's fate. Those who love, those who hate. He fell prey to the same catastrophe that the second conveys. However, unlike Madara, Sasuke chooses to walk with Konoha on the warfront. Despite another Uchiha offering a hand, Sasuke rejects it, and Tobirama no longer sees Madara in him. But Kagami, someone he trusts to pick up the slack, someone he laments when death approaches. Sasuke did not selfishly indulge in vengeance when enlightened. He had every right to, given his clan and Itachi's end. Instead, he works with the man who aided the Uchiha's ostracization, washing away Madara's effect on Tobirama. One man cannot encapsulate a whole community, but Tobirama's fears steered him toward that mindset. He acted in accordance with his love for the village, but it's that love that matures into so much hate in the next generations. His decision mirrors his criticism of the clan he pushed away. They aren't so different after all. Adults are stupid. They should sign treaties if they want to get rid of wars. A phrase Tobirama uttered in adolescence. This reasoning would persist as he matures. Ideology rooted in pragmatism. But it doesn't tackle why treaties can't just be signed. Hatred will linger if left unsettled. Scars won't always heal. He disregards the emotional weight of years of strife. And that's how he helped fuel the Uchiha's fire. Tobirama failed to see it during his time. 
So, he entrusts the future partly to one of the outcasts he helped create, and leads another enlightened soul to aid the one who gave him clarity. It was Sasuke's path that made Itachi acknowledge his failings, which in turn led him to help Kabuto acknowledge himself. And everything comes full circle back to Sasuke. Kabuto's self is restored, and Sasuke's life is restored in turn, with new power to assist his new path of shadow. But it's a different shadow that claims Madara's back once more. He was certain his side embodied him. Obito died and birthed a new Madara. Madara extracted a part of himself and birthed his will incarnate. But Obito never left. He was only lost. He could never be Madara Uchiha. No one can ever be someone else. And Black Zetsu was never what he appeared to be. Madara manipulated Obito, and he in turn is deceived by Black Zetsu. The Puppet Master is revealed to be just another puppet. Nothing ever goes as planned in this cursed world. He fails for a second time in a second life to heed his own words. He thought his ultimate plan to be an exception because he believed himself to be running the show. But the true director of this play initiates a plot twist that reveals history was acted to awake the sleeping ancient past. A past Black Zetsu attests all resides in her. She of the beginning. The pinnacle of power. Light shadow, and everything else a part of her. The status Madara spent two lifetimes climbing to achieve, Kaguya exudes the presence of a god without even trying. No need to spew vapid words to assert her dominance. What truly talks is the energy she radiates. Yet, despite this devastating aura, she failed once before in taking it all, and she would fail again soon after this revival, just like Madara. If it took two demigods to end her reign in the ancient past, it would take at least five shinobi to achieve the same result. Careful manipulation versus coordinated cooperation. And Sasuke, ironically now, is on the latter side. His plan is far more synonymous with Kaguya's methodology in nature, rather than the camaraderie he begrudgingly tolerates here. Madara was a relic of the past, and Kaguya a far more distant one. For someone who is soon to initiate a revolt against the past, all he can see are foolish beings stubbornly clinging onto existence. Things that should have been erased long ago. Yet, his disgust for their persistence could not be any more hypocritical, because his goal would make him everlasting all the same, controlling the world in his vision by his rules. Even his ambition, when described broadly, sounds all too familiar. But Sasuke cannot see the striking similarities he shares with his foes, because he closed his eyes immediately after opening them. In childhood, they were forced shut, and after that same man prized them open, Sasuke only uses that new sense to confirm the scarred world around him. He understands he is merely one of many cursed souls. And he ends his sightseeing there, closing his eyes by his own will this time. However, there's one thing that remains distinct between Sasuke and the goddess before him their potential. Kaguya is not human. Fundamentally, she's a creature detached from conventional emotion. Even when she discovers love, it's warped in her own comprehension. The Otsutsuki race are inherently possessive. Their very being is dependent on claiming something foreign and making it a part of themselves, which is consistent with her plan to make everything a part of her once again. But there's a catch. Humanity intervened. Otsutsukis are supposed to take it all and depart without looking back. But Kaguya never even left. She couldn't leave. Because she couldn't transform the alien concept of love like she could everything else. It stayed a novel feeling inside her. But this pure human emotion, when paired with Otsutsuki instinct, becomes corrupted. Her possessive nature that resounds throughout her race poisons attachment. She desperately vies to maintain a tight grip on the world because she loves it. She is hurt. Her sons would defy her nature and refuse to be complacent in her toxic infatuation. Kaguya loves Hagoromo and Hamura. She loves the planet. Which is why all the more wrath manifests when the world she spared from destruction revolts against her. Why she emits sorrow when her sons persist to resist through remnants eons later. Kaguya's love can only ever be translated through her Otsutsuki existence. She isn't human, after all. Something can never be something else. Yet Sasuke tries to achieve that same status, despite being human. The future he envisions for himself is synonymous with an alien from afar, controlling the world with force, becoming an everlasting god above it all. Black Zetsu created a story so Kaguya could rewrite it, and Sasuke yearns to render the past obsolete in the same vein. He can't see how his greatest adversary mirrors everything about the vision of his greatest self, he shut his eyes, after all. So now, all he can see is a future of shadow. 
Naruto, though, rejected that facade. After being told all his life he's a monster, the man conveyed the simple truth. And using that motivation, which initiated a path of redemption, Naruto aids another in finding his true self as well. Uchiha Obito dreamed of Hokage, but died before he could understand what that title meant. But Naruto resurrects Obito from the farcical shell of Madara, and in turn, reveals to him the validity in that forgotten path. Naruto could only illuminate this because he too was enlightened by others, could only save someone from hell because he's experienced it himself. And Obito returns the favor by showcasing the end of this long, arduous road, the ultimate action of a true Hokage, walking in front of the next generation to preserve it, sacrificing his piece on the shogi board to ensure the king survives to bloom new leaders, as all previous Hokage achieved with their demise. Naruto keeps his eyes open through it all. He sees Obito encapsulates everything he has been and will be, and he can see the truth Sasuke's darkness obscures. Despite his attempt to reach an inhuman position, he consistently demonstrates humanity in the battle against Kaguya. It reminds Naruto of the past, and Naruto's presence itself reminds Sasuke of it too. Every time he shows up, it's always like this. He couldn't sever it then, and now he's immersed in it again their first lesson as a team. That almost foreign concept to the current Sasuke is seamlessly utilized here. He never forgot, just tried to bury it away. And this instinct from the past earns Team 7 a victory against a goddess. Sasuke wouldn't have a chance to hope for a new future without them. But of course, he can't see that as he is now, for his revolution burns it all out of sight. He looks beyond everything, including his predecessors that he shares so much in common with. He's blind to the value in their end. They finally usurp the fate that tormented their existence. It takes another life, but the destiny bound to them spanned many generations in the first place. After the dust settles, when the carnage is left with a broken world, these two can still smile among the wreckage. War leads to peace. Light can only have presence if shadow exists. They are opposites, but they complement each other all the same. Hashirama and Madara, Naruto and Sasuke. One more generation to finally thread the two opposing sides into one. And all it'll take is for Naruto to showcase the result of his training. A training regimen that started when he learned empathy, matured when he learned endurance, recovered when he learned acceptance, and transcended when he learned the power of unity. And to complete this union, he just needs one more pivotal piece to begin his dream road to mend the broken Team 7. Where before, Naruto selfishly asserted he alone would fight and die with Sasuke, now, with Sakura and Kakashi at his back, he entrusts them to come to his aid when he finishes the task only he can accomplish, with both he and his rival alive. The last time they were here, Sasuke acknowledged Naruto as both his closest friend and equal, but only the former remains. His new path places him above all, including Naruto. Sasuke once said in this spot that his ambition was locked in the past. Now, in the same place, he extrapolates his new goal cemented in the future. What remains consistent, though, are his eyes. They've matured, yes, a representation of all he's been through, but they are fundamentally the same still closed. It took Itachi realizing his failings after death to pry them open, but his influence was transient. Just like the presence of the moon, his form was never constant. A silhouette lurking under the orb of night, illuminating nothing but bloodshed, swarming Sasuke with the shadows cast by the celestial body above. Then, like a waning crescent moon, he uses his final actions after failure to shed light on the darkness he spawned. Itachi's phases of life display one thing to Sasuke. His older brother failed to be the perfect shinobi because he couldn't maintain a full moon. He could not become its shadow of a tool because there was light he couldn't cut away. That light is Sasuke, his humanity. So Sasuke would do what Itachi could not, sever it all, and in the process become a new type of shadow, one created from the luminescence of fire, a fire shadow. In other words, Hokage, an everlasting shadow in an internal flame of his creation. Sasuke etched Itachi's path of shadow symbolized by the moon on his palm, but now that it's gone, he takes his empty hand and reaches to grasp the future by searing away the past. This is how he will surpass what used to be his goal. This is what he learns from his older brother's failure. 
However, there is another interpretation of that life, and it comes from the one who donned a sun on his palm. Naruto had a shadow inside him since birth, but the reality was, deeper down still, a root of light persisted stronger than ever. Two suns hovered at his origin. The shadow might have obscured them, but Naruto endured that darkness to finally see the rays of salvation. But it wasn't just those lights. Plenty more came to his aid on this journey to ensure his fire wouldn't extinguish. And now, these comrades have built a bonfire with Naruto at its center. One that can endure any shadow. Fire Shadow. His vision of Hokage. It is this road that scorched the shadow within and transformed it into shielding rays that illuminated the bleak battleground. It is this road that led him to another light that illuminated the first hint of a Hokage's true power. The same man who shaped Sasuke in the darkness was another guiding light for Naruto. His past failure versus his entrusted future of success. Naruto once told Itachi he saw himself as Sasuke's true brother, and to affirm that status, he'd have to do what the sibling veiled in shadow could not. Keep those eyes open. A task Itachi entrusted to his younger brother, surrogate brother, and Naruto recalls those words along with others. A fellow shield's declaration. Neji and Sasuke were both lost because of their clan's blight. That darkness weighed them down. But that gravity didn't stop them from moving fast enough to save the same friend. And their closed eyes weren't sewn. Naruto opened Neji's, and Neji entrusted Naruto to do the same for Sasuke. He failed before. But that failure was the best thing that ever happened for his path, because it led him to more failure. And it is when he finally confronted all the failures that he made his first step on this road to Hokage. He's only made it this far because he's been chasing Sasuke. In effect, chasing the world's darkness, confronting it time and time again. And finally, he's grown enough to catch the densest shadow of all. Back then, Sasuke's victory showed Naruto the flaw in his goal. Now, it's time for Naruto to reciprocate. He would win this time, show Sasuke the flaw in his goal, and demonstrate to the world his idea of resolution in the aftermath. Once, a long time ago, Naruto uttered words that are relevant now, but Sasuke didn't hear them. He couldn't hear them. The world never gave him a chance. That scarred beast wore a demon's mask. Despite his outward appearance, that's all it ever was. A mask. He, like all shinobi, could never usurp his core, his human heart. And Sasuke parallels this idea with perfect precision. Is he a god? Can he ever be a god? No. He himself hesitates when he describes where his road would lead him, a dark mass feeding on the ashes of malice so that no one else has to suffer the same. Yet he chokes every step of the way, a wounded demon embracing the shinobi life to thrive, yet constantly looking toward a goal that would place him above the system that weaponizes him. Both are self-inflicted burdens. Both are doomed to fail at the hands of their own humanity. All it took was one weeping boy to show Zabuza his error, Perhaps that's all it would take if Sasuke remembered that flood of emotion now. But it's impossible to remember what he never saw. The world of the past always shielded Sasuke from light. So, he embraces a future of shadow. It's the only comfort he's known, after all. Even during the time he felt a different embrace, it was revealed to be suffocating, giving Sasuke a home at Itachi's expense. Everything in the past created by those who preached of peace has brought nothing but conflict nothing but pain for Sasuke. So why would he follow along the same trail? Why would he listen to a crying world that never listened to his pleas? Why would he listen to Naruto, a proponent of this faulty world? Yet he does listen. He connects. The one fragment of the world that gives him some reciprocation. It's comforting, and it contradicts this false god. It shows him there's a chance to feel this through others, to connect with them on a mutual basis. That's why he's so desperate to cut it away. Because it's the only link to his error. Small though it may be, the inconsistency rattles Sasuke to his core. And it's because of his core that he can't ignore Naruto. Someone so unlike him, yet seamlessly links with him at the same time. Two opposites that are perpetually drawn to one another, clash with one another, and gain more resonance with one another as a result. 
but their differences in acknowledgement deters their unification. Sasuke never had the assistance that introspection requires. Even when he progressed through outside influence on his path, it was either for exploitation or due to trauma. Where Naruto has progressed with the help of others, people who lent a hand solely because they yearned to see him blossom. And so, their final forms represent these diametrical experiences all the same. Naruto's ultimate Kurama, where he cooperates with what was once his inner demon, Sasuke's enhanced Susano, achieved by exploiting the tailed beasts, siphoning power from those helpless and trapped creatures. Quite similar to what Kaguya did with the Divine Tree, the position Madara planned to occupy. Sasuke's end goal and methodology is so alike the foes he defeated, but what's unalike his last enemy is the thing buried beneath that cold gaze. Naruto doesn't flaunt his strength because he knows he only has it thanks to them. Sasuke revels in his Uchiha lineage because that's all he has left of his clan to cling to. Quite ironic, being that he yearns to render those memories irrelevant. His Uchiha power is what separates he and his adversary. It is what makes him the strongest. Sasuke deludes himself into believing he alone is powerful enough to bear everyone's suffering because he believes he's powerful enough to rid his own. But he hasn't forgotten. He can't forget. He can only avert his eyes from what happened. But even if he looks away, it'll still be there. Even if only peripheral, it will never elude his sight because it's what shaped him into the man he is now. How can a future built atop a blank space be possible if the one forming it is shaped by the past? How can Sasuke become an everlasting shadow if his center is one of light? His godlike energy that he would use to hover above all, when it trickles out, he's just like anyone else. Feet on the ground, throwing desperate punches to claim victory. But when faced with a man who's acknowledged himself, this kind of battle, he can't hope to win. Sasuke relies on his dojutsu for his trump card, but when that power sizzles out midway, he's countered easily by eyes that are truly open. This time, every step of the way, Naruto is ahead of him. Now it's time for Sasuke to find out why. It's a simple thing, really. With all the complexities that shape a burdened mind, it's the most basic of conveyances that penetrate the deepest. A friend, a connection, what it means to Naruto is an extension of what he learned on the most important day of his life, the beginning of this story. And he uses a semblance of that lesson here. Naruto proved his might, but it's his simple words at the battle's end that make the more profound statement. It's something his opponent tried to forget. Now that Sasuke can't move his body, he makes an effort to move anything. First, his eyelids, then his mind. He recollects on a time when he looked around him. And the most prominent scenery of all? Team 7. Family. It didn't die after that disaster, with pain, hatred, and suffering. Love can always be reclaimed. All it takes is the acknowledgement of one's shattered heart, then an effort to pick up the pieces with acceptance, an acceptance of all that was done to him and all that he did. Sasuke tried to sever it all, but that is why he's weaker than the one who did not because he could never sever everything. Humans can't cut away their heart, no matter how broken it is. Yes, he can see it now. Why Naruto seems so far ahead of him, despite his equivocal power. It's because he is ahead of him. He's already acknowledged his painful past, accepted it, healed his heart on that same road, and come out with his love for the world bolstered as a result. Detachment is a vapid form of enlightenment. It's a shortcut that doesn't require its pursuers to walk alongside the world's struggles. And a true Hokage never takes a shortcut. That's what this dream means to Naruto. Why his vision of Hokage is superior. Sasuke keeps his eyes open to see all of his rival. And, in effect, he sees the world through him as well. The potential for it to experience the same transition Naruto did. But Naruto couldn't do it alone. It took shadows that challenged his light for him to burn brighter. It took other lights supporting him to endure those shadows when their darkness became too heavy. All of it, both good and bad, have led to this moment. All the more beautiful because of the strife that preceded it. Unity born from conflict. A glimpse into the world's potential future. Sasuke accepts this vision, and a new path of healing commences. A road only made possible because he acknowledges the things he tried to ignore. He acknowledges his humanity, acknowledges Naruto, and acknowledges the world. And 
In effect, the world finally reciprocates. It shows Sasuke the piece of the equation he left out. The nations did indeed come together to face a common enemy, but it is through that shared experience of war that new connections form. The warring lands become close-knit comrades in arms, those who can share a drink as war buddies. A conclusion Hashirama longed for globally, one he was able to experience with Madara at his second end. And now, through Naruto and Sasuke's union, the dream is actualized. A new era of unprecedented peace spawns from the greatest conflict in history. An equilibrium is reached. Balance wins again. And the loser of that second battle vows to live in this new world with his eyes open this time. Not just retracing the steps he's taken before with awareness, but going everywhere possible to gain even more insight. And that... He does, because it is Sasuke's words from his future self that have the privilege to convey the final message of this story. He couldn't have begun this growth without Naruto, couldn't have survived without Sakura, and couldn't have been granted a second chance without Kakashi. Team 7, his surrogate family, enable him to take his first step on a new path of redemption, and Sasuke would return the favor to Kakashi, to Sakura, and to Naruto. Balance persists, Naruto being right, Sasuke being wrong. This too would course correct. Sasuke would eventually hone ideology superior to his rival, enlightening the one who once enlightened him. And so, he beats on, becoming a shadow that assists from afar. But unlike the Leaf's previous system, Sasuke works closely in tandem with the Light. They complement each other, and they achieve so much through their juxtaposed yet cooperative roles. The sage's hope is realized through the two that defy their destiny of conflict. He walks, he sees, he endures. For endurance is what a shinobi needs to thrive. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed. And please do share this video if you got a lot out of it. I put my all into this one, so I'm hoping to see it garner some attention. Especially because this is the end for me. Well, the end for my Naruto videos anyway. But with every conclusion, new beginnings spawn. New generations are born. I'm done with Naruto for the foreseeable future, but not for the Naruto-verse. There's much to talk about in my next entries. Boruto's up next. If this is your first video you've seen from me, or you're a returning fan that hasn't been here in a while, I have a load of Naruto content that you can indulge in at your leisure over on my channel. A lot of my videos don't even reflect my meager subscriber count, so many of you are sure to have missed at least one video from me at some point. Check it out if you like what you see. Consider supporting me on Patreon to get exclusive benefits. Link in the description down below. Even a $3 pledge goes a long way. And for that amount, you can be on screen with these beautiful people here. Huge thank you to my top supporters, Sensei Krolon, Johnny, and Dre. Another big shout out to Trapham for the epic thumbnail as usual. If you want to talk to me and many others in my community, join my Discord. It's free for anyone to join. You can find the link in the About Me section of my Patreon page. Well, that's all folks, for now. Spice Boy, out.